so my name is Eric Frank. Um, I, my background is a uh, uh, number of years at uh, Thompson, and, and then uh, which became Cengage, and then Pearson uh, in product development, content acquisitions roles, uh, headed up global marketing for a division of Pearson uh, for a number of years, and then in 2007 started uh, Flat World Knowledge, which was an openly licensed uh, digital college textbook publishing company. Um, that company is uh, doing well today and recently left to uh, join a new venture, to start a new venture uh, in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University. And Carnegie Mellon University, for those of you who know it, uh, brings sort of a triangle of deep expertise in, in, in cognitive science, the theory of how people learn, um, human computer interaction, how people use computers to do things in their lives, and software engineering. And so they started a research project a decade ago, and the question they asked themselves was, um, w can we take what we know about the science of learning, how people learn, apply it to online learning environments, and produce measurable improvements in learning? Measurable being a very important word there. And 10 years later, the research is back, 20 plus peer-reviewed papers, and the answer is, it looks like the answer is yes, at least in some disciplines. And um, by that, I mean that students are doing better on things like pretests, post tests, midterms, final exams, uh, retention 12 months later of the information, the content that they, t they learned, um, and most importantly, in an online environment tested against the traditional classroom, uh, learning the content in 50 to 70 percent of the time on task that it's taking the students in the traditional classroom. Um, so I don't advocate what I'm about to talk about as the solution to education. I think it's far from that. Um, but I think about as we, as we think about the world of textbooks and we think about what they become in the future, um, the work that a student is doing outside of the classroom sometimes needs to be about learning some foundational material. So that, I think, in some ways this dovetails quite nicely, they can come to class and the teacher has more information about what the student knows and what they don't know and is able to engage in problem-based learning and inquiry-based learning uh, when they're in the classroom given a better foundation of what's happening outside the classroom. So I want to just talk a little bit about this idea of web analytics to improve learning. So this is a little bit uh, uh, not quite the point of the, 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 uh, the session, I think, in some ways. This idea, I think, was what are students experiencing outside their, the classroom consciously in the culture and life of students that's not happening in the classroom. Um, this is a little different in the sense that as web consumers of almost any age, um, we leave data trails everywhere we go. So this is about this idea uh, of data on the web. Um, and those data trails are valuable uh, in many different ways to many different players. Those data trails, where we've been and what we've done, uh, can reveal a lot about our sentiments, our attitudes, our social connections, and, and they can predict to some degree what it is that we might do next. And you can see applications of this all over the place. Um, uh, the CIA, uh, all intelligence uh, operations around the world um, looking for uh, monitoring of online activity to try to predict who might do something um, that they would prefer that they don't do um, so that they can uh, launch, operate in advance of things happening. Um, this is a, uh, a three million dollar prize in healthcare uh, where uh, the idea was, uh, can you build algorithms um, to basically identify who is likely to end up in a hospital next year. And if you can figure out us, help us identify who will be in a hospital next year, maybe we can do something to prevent that. And for insurance companies, you can imagine that this would be a very valuable uh, asset to have. Um, uh, similar uh, uh, activity with Deloitte, um, trying to predict lifespans for life insurance companies based on uh, data uh, of what people are doing uh, around the web and algorithms to try to uh, determine how long they might live. Um, certainly in the world of, of every website we visit, um, there's probably some tool underneath it gathering data about what pages we're visiting, how long we're spending there, what we're doing there, and somebody is analyzing that data trying to figure out how to keep you there a little bit longer, uh, generally of benefit to the advertiser uh, who's trying to advertise something to you. So there are basically recommenders and matchers everywhere based on algorithms using the data that we are leaving behind in data trails online. Um, what about education? So this is a bad picture of me. Um, but this is how I feel when people talk about what I just talked about and then say that, oh, well, 
all this goes on, I think that I can be the Amazon of education. I can take all this big data and I can run algorithms on it and I can figure out what works. And, and we can recommend to students things that work versus things that don't work and we're gonna solve all the ills in education. I fundamentally don't believe it. Um, I don't believe the sort of big data uh, approach to uh, educational learning analytics is going to work. Our outcomes are not the same as Netflix. They're not the same as Amazon. Um, they're, they're very different. So what are the outcomes of many uh, of the entities online? Uh, well, if you have a data mining algorithm, it wants to optimize for something. So let's call something profit. Um, and if you're Amazon or Netflix, um, what you're basically trying to do is say, I did X to my product. Um, in the case of, say, recommending a movie to you, I made a movie recommendation to you on Netflix. Um, did they give me more dollars? And I can keep testing this idea. And if you get it right one in a hundred times, that was worth it to you to run that analysis and make the suggestion because you got one more purchase and you did no harm, arguably. We don't have it that easy in education. Um, if we want to do learning analytics right, it's a lot more work, but I think that the payoff is potentially tremendous. So our outcomes, learning, are very complex, as, as you just saw um, in, in, in the example of, of trying to learn about the French Revolution, you're also trying to learn how to be a learner. Um, so we have complex outcomes, and the inputs aren't that obvious either, right? We have a, a whole rich set of inputs into what educating somebody means. Um, but I think in an online environment, um, we have an opportunity for the first time ever when the student's interacting with content and material online uh, to measure learning the entire time in which they are online um, and track how those activities should further shape the educational experience that they're having. So I'll define this idea broadly of education analytics as the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting about data, of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which learning occur. So this is a broad definition of education analytics, but not all education analytics are the same. So I think about them this way, borrowed from uh, Mike Sharkey uh, at, at, at the University of Phoenix, actually, that there are learning analytics. What is somebody actually learning? And can we measure what they're actually learning? There are engagement analytics, which we think of as, uh, and these are the two primary, I think, types of analytics that people talk about today. I think about engagement analytics as clickstream data. This is sort of what I was talking about to a large degree with, with uh, uh, Netflix, uh, Amazon, et cetera. This is analyzing the clickstream of a student. It's what a learning management system might be gathering. What time did they log in? How many times did they log in? How long did they stay? How many objects did they interact with? How many pages did they view? What did they do? Um, I think of all that as useful. It's, it, but it's a proxy for learning. It's about engagement. Is the student engaged or not? As opposed to learning data, which are course level outcomes and skills and competencies, the things a student is supposed to be able to do when they're finished with a course. Um, so I think that clickstream data tells us if a student is using material, but not what they're doing with it, why that interaction, what it's supposed to achieve, and whether it was achieved or not. Whereas I think about learning level analytics, as about gathering up the kinds of things you might ask yourself if you're a teacher and you're trying to analyze a student's performance. Um, how often is the student getting it right on the first try? Do they eventually get it right? How often are they asking for help? Um, is this a difficult skill? Is it not a difficult skill? You have to take into account all of these things if you're going to generate meaningful analytics. So I think that answering these and many other questions require semantic data. You can't really get semantic data that generates meaningful learning analytics unless you have uh, understand the inputs into the system. So um, this is really in some ways about design of online education, design of online content, design of online experiences in an intentional way to be able to generate out of them uh, uh, semantic data that provides meaningful insight into what a student has learned and has not learned. Uh, so I'll give you one example of this and I'll show you something and then that will bring us to a close. So with clickstream data, uh, we can learn basically student X clicked Y at time Z. Fundamentally, that's, that's sort of what clickstream data can tell us. Whereas with semantic data, as the student's working through, say, an activity or a problem or a multi-step problem online, we can say student X has asked for his second hint on part three of the question, what are the five steps of this program? And 
The system told that student back, recall that you need to identify a base case for your function. The correct answer will be line five. The question is related to the specific skill in the model called the recursive base case. And it's often mistakenly answered as line four due to a common misconception. That's a lot of information about the, the content um, that we know. That student proceeds with clickstream data and we learn again that student X clicked Y at time Z. Uh, whereas with semantic data, we can capture and store that student X has now moved on and they've selected line five, which is correct. They were given this feedback, you're correct, line five is the base case. This was her third try though, it's the first question about this particular skill um, and uh, it's the third related question in the material. So we have a lot of information if we design online content and online environments intentionally. So what can we do when we know this? We can generate very meaningful, I think, feedback loops based on student learning data. Feedback loops to the student themselves, to instructors or teachers who are teaching those students, to, to somebody if they're responsible for course design, maybe that's CET, who built a course and a teacher's using that course and a student's learning from that course. And I think that the basic principles here are familiar uh, with most people who've designed course content, right? Which is this triangle of um, very clear and measurable learning objectives tied to instructional activities for each of those learning objectives um, with formative primarily, but some summative assessments that provide feedback on the student's status on those knowledge and skills. Uh, underlying, I think, something like this, meaningful analytics, is, is a very uh, uh, thorough and concrete skill map, which says these are literally all the objectives, all the skills mapped to each of those objectives, and hopefully uh, across something like Bloom's taxonomy, so that we're not just asking base level stuff like, do you remember this, did you understand it, but can you apply this? Um, and you can have all of those levels incorporated into a skill map. Um, and so I'm going to give you an example from the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University uh, of, of just a few elements of what that learning experience looks like. So there might be a, a subject in uh, uh, statistics, there might be a little bit of content, there might be a multimedia walkthrough after the, the, the text that walks the student through how to do something, and then immediately there's learn by doing. There is this idea of supported practice, where the student now has to input something. Uh, this case is a, 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 an Oscar winner's uh, data about uh, a data set from uh, uh, the Oscars, uh, which is an award for uh, TV and movies in the United States. Um, and the student now has to input variables uh, in this particular question. Uh, they input, if they get the wrong answer, they get specific feedback about why that answer is wrong. Um, they follow that up with, okay, did I get this? Now I'm gonna do a self-check problem um, where they actually are able to go through, uh, they're able to work through this problem. Again, they're getting feedback on right and wrong answers. Um, uh, in this case, in this particular problem, uh, they're trying to determine forces, uh, vector forces in a statics problem, so this is higher education content. Uh, but again, they're working through a problem, they're entering responses, they're getting hints. Um, if they want to, uh, like a tutor, they don't understand it yet, they want to expand the problem, they can expand the problem and work through an additional set of steps, get additional hints for that particular step. Um, and eventually there's opportunities to synthesize. So they can actually, this is a chemistry lab, but the idea is every few modules of online content, they have to synthesize what they've learned. Here they're trying to figure out uh, level of arsenic contamination in well water in Bangladesh and trying to uh, figure out if this well water is above or below World Health Organization uh, standard. Um, but ultimately, out of all that, we're able to capture very important data about the student's learning state. Um, so this is an example of a dashboard um, uh, that, it, that an instructor might get as the student's working through that content. So here are, on the left you see the learning objectives, or at the top I should say. Um, if, if the bars to the left are gray, it means a student hasn't done enough practice for us to make a meaningful evaluation of whether they know this learning objective or not. If it's on the other end and it's green, um, then we can assume they know it, and if it's in the middle, they're at varying states of trouble. They don't know it well enough yet. Um, and if you click on, this bottom one is expanded, um, and what that now shows is a, a by student learning estimate. So I can now click on any particular uh, area and see the number of students and exactly who they are that are struggling with their particular concept. Uh, I can communicate with those individual students. Um, uh, and I can also drill, I'm sorry, I can also drill down by 
if you look back here in this sub-objective, there's also, uh, or this objective, there are also sub-objectives. So there are specific little skills that make up that learning objective, and I can drill down by sub-objective uh, to see uh, what an individual student knows. So now I'm on a fake student here, and I'm on that particular learning objective, and all the sub-objectives, I can see the problems that students worked, and so I can keep drilling down for uh, meaningful data. Um, a student themselves can benefit from this data being incorporated into course material that they're working through. Um, this happens to be uh, a student view as they begin a new module of content. It's telling them what they know and what they don't know. Uh, it's generating an individual learning plan uh, based uh, on the student's uh, specific knowledge. Um, and the student can click down here in that learning plan to get additional practice. So again, it's sort of saying, this is, we understand that you know these things, you don't know these things. We're not telling you what to do, we're not directing you through the material, but we're giving you an option uh, based on what you don't know to do more work. Um, and I'll give you just one more quick example. These are very low fidelity uh, mock-ups, but the idea being that for someone who designed a course, you could actually know before a course was released whether it was complete. Um, do I have all the learning objectives? If I have a learning objective, do I have uh, activities and assessments tied to it? Um, and, and so you can see whether a course is actually ready for release. Um, you can imagine um, looking at a course afterwards as a course designer and identifying objectives where there's low performance relative to a standard and say, I want to drill down and find all the objectives where students went through and there were low performance. And then I can drill in on any one of those. I can see where the low performance is. I can drill down to the content. And I can assess why uh, the students might be underperforming on that objective. Um, so I just wanted to give that as an example of, I think, what's possible if we think, start thinking about something different than the textbook paradigm for this kind of content, which is content that uh, needs to be absorbed and understood, and then more creative things can happen in class. Uh, if we move away from a traditional textbook paradigm and into an online environment where students are interacting with content designed to generate meaningful learning analytics. Um, I'll conclude by, by a warning, which is that uh, Michael Feldstein, is an education blogger in the US, wrote, since doing good learning analytics is hard, uh, we often do easy learning analytics and pretend they are good instead. And I think that this is a risk as we move into the world of learning analytics. Um, we have all had this experience. Um, you know, just because I watched the Britney Spears video does not mean uh, that, uh, or because I did look up something on IBM that I should be watching a Britney Spears video, right? Uh, sometimes recommendations don't go well. It doesn't hurt us in this environment. Um, there are some pretty bad analytics out there. Um, so for example, this is no, it's a textbook reader. Um, and so here it's measuring, you know, how much, how many pages did I read? How long was I logged into my ebook? How many annotations did I make? And it's telling me my overall progress is excellent and it's giving me an engagement score. What does any of that actually mean? Maybe I'm not a note taker. Maybe I left the computer on and I walked out for half a day and came back. Um, and so I think there's danger uh, to do a lot of uh, bad uh, analytics. But I think we have an opportunity to actually measure what learning is taking place, to use that data to inform course design and improvement, to inform instruction, and to enable students to inform their own pathway through content more effectively. Uh, and that's an opportunity that is available to, to us.